Now last year we, we began our journey through Judges, which tells about the Israelite settlement of the land into tribal groups. And this was after the Lord had guided Joshua and the people in conquering the promised land. It is a difficult book to study with the unbelief of the people, tribal violence and individual depravity that is sickening. Over the course of 300 years and 12 judges, one from each tribe, they were raised up by God to lead and save the people. Why did Israel need judges or saviors? Remember the cycle of sin in Judges? For a while the people served the Lord, then they fell into the trap of sin, drawn away by false gods. The Lord became angry and handed them over to their enemies who made their lives a misery in slavery. And then at long last they would remember to call on God in supplication and beg him to rescue them. In his grace and mercy, the Lord raised up judges who were saviors for their people. Let's review where we've been in Judges so far. On this chart, the Judges are outlined in green. Below this, approximate dates are noted with the reigns of the Egyptian pharaohs. The first judge was Othniel, just an ordinary kind of spiritual guy from Judah, who delivered his people from the king of Aram. Next, we have Ehud, the left-handed <coughs> me, the left-handed hero in the days when left-handedness was considered strange. Then Shamgar used an ox goad to save his people. After that, we studied Deborah with Barak. This story was an uplifting one, as the people looked to God for guidance and gave him all the praise for their victory. Have you noticed how many heroic women figure in Judges? They range from godly Deborah to the anonymous woman who smashed in Abimelech's head. Gideon reminded us that God can use the weak and faithful to his glory when he defeated the Midianites. After him came two so-called minor judges, Tola and Jair. God also used Jephthah, despised of being a person who was hated and despised by his family, and he brought victory. Around the time of Jephthah, there were three more minor judges who led Israel in succession. Ibzar, Elan, and Abdon. Funny they're not popular names, though. <laughs> Finally, Samson, chosen by God from before birth to begin to defeat the battle of Philistines. Samson did that in an individualistic way, using his tremendous strength and even foxes and donkeys' jaws. If you were God, would you continue to love and care for your people after the way they treated you? They turned to idols at the first opportunity and disobeyed at every opening. I know that I would have sent down fire and brimstone in large quantities. And even most of the judges were flawed. Gideon led the people away from the Lord with idol worship. Jephthah sacrificed his only daughter. And Samson tre carelessly treated God's hand on his life. And after Gideon, God disciplined his people by allowing them to face the penalty of their sin. Their false idols would be a trap for them and he would not drive out their enemies anymore. Our God is just so awe-inspiring to stick with his sinful, ungrateful people in those days. And amazingly, the Lord still said, I will never break my covenant with you in Judges 2.1. Now, my original decision was to teach about the four judges who are listed in the New Testament book of Hebrews and mention the other eight on the way. I had decided the last four chapters in Judges were too revolting to talk about in a congregation setting. But I had forgotten two things. Firstly, I didn't ask God for his guidance. And secondly, I had forgotten that important verse in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. In these verses, the Apostle Paul is actually talking about the Old Testament. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that all God's people may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. <coughs> and that includes what we think are boring family tree lists, Old Testament laws, sections we don't understand, and of course, all that violence and skullduggery. 
So, let's get our mud boots on again and wave to the judges just one more time. These last chapters, 17 to 21, are the climax of the book. Initially, I was surprised at what I considered to be irregularities. First of all, there's not a Canaanite enemy in sight. Secondly, there are no judges mentioned. Thirdly, the events actually took place quite early in the settlement of Israel, around the time of the first judge, Othniel. We know this because the priest Phineas from Joshua times was still alive. Like me, you may be asking why not have chronological order? We must remember the Bible is not just history. The Bible is all about God's love for his people, how he revealed himself to them and led them. And inspired writers use history to make the point. The first story concerns a man called Micah from Ephraim and the Danites, an adjoining tribe. The second is about civil war with the Benjamites. Let's read chapter, let's listen to chapter 17. shekels of silver that were taken from you, and about which I heard you utter a curse. I have that silver with me. I took it. Then his mother said, The Lord bless you, my son. When he returned the eleven hundred shekels of silver to his mother, she said, I saw consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son, to make an image overlaid with silver. I will give it back to you. So after he returned the silver to his mother, she took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to a silversmith who used them to make the idol. And it was put in Micah's house. Now this man Micah had a shrine and he made an ephod and some household gods and installed one of his sons as his priest. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. A young Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, who had been living within the clan of Judah, left that town in search of some other place to stay. On his way, he came to Micah's house in the hill country of Ephraim. Micah asked him, Where are you from? I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, he said, and I'm looking for a place to stay. Then Micah said to him, Live with me and be my father and priest and I'll give you ten shekels of silver a year, your clothes and your food. So the Levite agreed to live with him, and the young man became like one of his sons to him. Then Micah installed the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in his house. And Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will be good to me, since this Levite has become my priest. Here we have an Israelite family from Ephraim who live in God's presence. We can tell that by the way they speak devoutly about the Lord. His mother says spiritual things like, the Lord bless you. And later, I solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord. This is a woman on close terms with the Lord. And her son Micah, whose name means, who is like Yahweh, also speaks fondly of God. The Lord will be good to me. And what I have just said is a whole load of garbage, bunkum and hogwash. Let's look at what was really going on. Let's have a look at my way into Micah. Without any guilt, Micah had stolen a total of 13 kilograms of silver shekels from his mother, enough to live on for a lifetime. He had forgotten Deuteronomy 5.19, you shall not steal. Micah only returned the silver when he heard his mother curse the person who stole it. He certainly did not remember Deuteronomy 5.16, honour your father and mother. When Micah returned the silver, instead of being angry and rebuking Micah, his mother blessed him for stealing a fortune from her. She gave some of the shekels to a silversmith to make her son an idol. Now his mother had forgotten Exodus 24-5. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. 
Now this idol was not a new thing for Micah as he added it to his collection of idols. The very first commandment taught the Israelites, you shall have no other gods before or beside me. To complete his little worship centre, Micah made his son a priest. Once again disobeying, as the Israelites had been told, the priests were only to be from the tribe of Levi. When a real priest, a Levite, came along, Micah was really pleased and appointed this man. However, Levites were not for the personal use of individuals, but were to maintain correct worship procedures in the community. The Levite himself should not have been wandering around to seek his fortune, as the Levites had been assigned to particular duties in particular cities. Micah's era was self-styled worship. Mentioning God's name in a devout way does not necessarily mean we worship and obey the Lord. It is so easy to say the right words and to fool people that we are in close relationship with the Lord. But Micah blatantly took no notice of God's commandments. Now you and I need to, rec to examine our hearts regularly to see if our devotion is just a show for others or if we are really determined to love and obey the Lord. So next, in chapter 18, we read that the Danites were moving north instead of driving the Canaanites off their God-given fertile land. They sent out five spies who came to the hill country of Ephraim and spent the night at Micah's place. They recognised the Levite and he told them he was now Micah's priest. He inquired of God for the spies and told them that their journey would be successful. They checked out the city of Laish inhabited by peaceful people with no nearby support. When they returned home, they told the other Dianites, it's perfect. On the way to do battle, they stole Micah's idols and his priest. He rallied his friends to get them back, but was outnumbered. Then they, the Dianites, took what Micah had made and his priest and went on to Laish against the peaceful and unsuspecting people. They attacked them with a sword and burned down their city and there was no one to rescue them because they lived a long way from Sidon and had no relationship with anyone else. The city was in a valley near Bethrehob. And the Danites rebuilt the city and settled there and named it Dan after their ancestor Dan, who was born to Israel. <coughs> Though the city used to be called Laish, there were Danites, there the Danites set up for themselves the idol. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Moses, and his sons were priests for the tribe of Dan until the time of the captivity of the land. They continued to use the idol Micah had made all the time the house of God was in Shiloh. Let's look at the disobedient Danites. They acted in the same vein as Micah. They did not want to settle in their allocated territory. It was too hard. They forgot Joshua chapter 19, 51 which tells us that the territories were assigned by lot to each of the clans at Shiloh in the presence of the Lord. Now, they sent out spies who ended up at Micah's place. There, they wrongly consulted the Levite for God's direction. The Danites stole Micah's idols and persuaded the priests to go with them to a bigger ministry. Like Micah, they wanted other gods rather than the one true God. The Danites brutally attacked a peaceful and unsuspecting people, then went ahead and stole their land. They continued to have their own form of worship, even though it was forbidden. They should have worshipped where the Lord had stated, and at that time the house of the Lord was at Shiloh. The Danites' big mistake was self-seeking security. We should also wait on God and rest secure on Him, not rushing ahead or running away to establish our own security as the Danites did. 
And then what a shock to find out that the Levi who was unnamed earlier is none other than Jonathan, a descendant of Moses. It is unbelievable that so quickly he had forgotten his godly heritage from the leader of God's people. And it's often been said that God has no grandchildren. It is not acceptable to depend on going to church, doing good deeds, or putting on a religious show. Each person must make their commitment to the Lord to love and obey him faithfully as he directs. The Levite Jonathan's era was to choose self-determined service. He advanced his career at the cost of obedience. Success or prosperity is not necessarily the result of right action. It may in fact be the opposite. Beware of dwelling on self-serving ambition. We will now look briefly at the civil war which is recorded in the closing chapters of Judges. One commentator goes so far as to say this is the ugliest story in the Bible, and I would have to agree with him. I warn you, this is a restricted 18 plus rating. It contains sexual and physical violence, and I have made it as brief as possible. Now, an urgent call went out to all the Israelites. The Israelites from Dan to Beersheba and from the land of Gilead came out with one accord and assembled before the Lord at Mizpah. The leaders of all the people of the tribes of Israel took their places in the assembly of the people of God. 400,000 soldiers armed with swords. The Benjaminites heard that the Israelites had drawn to Mizpah. Then the Israelites said, Tell us how this awful thing happened. So the Levite, the husband of the murdered woman, said, I and my concubine came to Gibea and Benjamin to spend the night. So during the night, the men of Gibea came after me and surrounded the house, intending to kill me. They raped my concubine and she died. So I took my concubine, cut her into pieces and sent one piece to each region of Israel's inheritance because they committed this rude and outrageous act in Israel. Now, all you Israelites, speak up and give your verdict. All the people rose with one accord saying, None of us will go home. No, not one of us will return to his house. But now, this is what we'll do to Gibea. We'll go up against it, as the lot directs. The tribes of Israel sent messengers throughout the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What about this awful crime that was committed among you? Now then, Turn those wicked men of Gibea over to us so that we may put them to death and purge the evil from Israel. But the Benjaminites would not listen to their fellow Israelites. From their towns they came together at Gibea to fight against the Israelites. The Benjamites refused to give up the offenders and instead went to war with the rest of Israel. They were actually fighting their own tribal brothers. So the Israelites met at Bethel and asked God about going to fight them. The Lord said that the tribe of Judah was to lead them. These people who had committed those terrible sins needed to be punished. So it was right for them to do this. Twice the Israelites went against them without success. The battle was a right one, but it seems the Israelites had gone out in their own self-confidence and had been defeated. Then all the Israelites, the whole army, went up to Bethel, and there they sat, weeping before the Lord. They fasted that day until evening, and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. 
and the Israelites inquired of the Lord. In those days, the Ark of the Covenant of God was there, with Phineas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, ministering before it. And they asked, Shall we go up against and fight the Benjaminites, our fellow Israelites, or not? The Lord responded, Go, for tomorrow I will give them into your hand. Then Israel set an ambush around Judea, and on that day, 25,000 Benjaminites swordsmen fell, all of them valiant fighters. But 600 men turned and fled into the wilderness to the Rock of Rimmon, where they stayed for four months. The men of Israel went back to Benjamin and put all the towns to the sword, including the animals and everything else they found. All in the towns and all the towns they came across, they set on fire. The other tribes vowed that they would not give any of their daughters in marriage to Benjamin. So now, they had a dilemma. Although there were 600 brother Benjaminites left, they had no access to wives. Then all the Israelites gathered again at Bethel. There must be a solution, they said, as they looked around at each other. Aha! One bright spark exclaimed, Nobody from Jabesh Gilead is here. Problem solved. They sent 12,000 men to the town to kill everyone except the virgin and hey presto, wives of the Benjamites. <laughs> they made peace with the Benjamites and gave them the women. However, there were not enough to go around. Ah, oh, hang on, there's a festival on at Shiloh. This is what you Benjamites must do. So they instructed the Benjaminites, saying, Go and hide in the vineyards and watch. When the young women of Shiloh come out to join in the dancing, then rush out from the vineyards and each of you seize a wife from the young women of Shiloh and go back to the, your land of Benjamin. And when their fathers or brothers complain to us, we will say to them, there you go, do us a kindness by helping them. Because we did not get wives for them during the war. And you are innocent since you did not give your daughters to them. They just took them. So, that is what the Benjaminites did. While the young women were dancing, each man caught one and carried her off to be his wife. Then they returned to their inheritance and rebuilt the towns and settled in them. At that time, the Israelites left the, that place and went home to their tribes and clans, each to his own inheritance. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. It's a ghastly story, isn't it? So, so quickly the people had moved away from their trust in God. Let's look at the illogical Israelites and try and get these ghastly events in perspective. So terrible atrocities had been committed by the Gibeons when they raped the concubine. And that was, she was from a clan, an Israelite clan, one of their own people. And the Benjamites, rather than handing the criminals over, continue to protect their brothers rather than continue in love and loyalty to God. The Israelites were right to punish the Benjamites, but their slaughter of many other innocent people was unjustified. And in their effort to provide wives for Benjamin, they wrongly killed more people in Jabesh Gilead. 
They override the rights, rights of innocent, you, innocent young women in Shiloh by kidnapping. As we've already noted, there's not a Canaanite mentioned anywhere in these accounts. The spiritual corruption of the Israelites came from within, wanting to live their lives independent of God. Israel error was self-ruling sinfulness. This is summed up in the final verse of the book. In those days, Israel had no king, everyone did as they saw fit. And so we come to the conclusion of a Bible book that is difficult to read and to understand. And yet it is a vitally important book for us Christians today. Are we any different to the Israelites? Our error too is self-ruling sinfulness. So often we do what we feel like doing without consulting <coughs> the Lord or his word. Oh, but we need to be very careful <coughs> because sometimes God gives us what we want and we have to face the consequences of that choice. I have often heard people who, who have behaved wrongly say, the devil made me do it or Satan is targeting me. This may be true on occasions, but more often it's our sinful actions that come from our hearts. As Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, 20 to 23, from within, out of your hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice and deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. And personally, in my own heart, that's my problem. I battle with evil thoughts every day and have to remember to call out to God for help. Now churches too can be, assumed, can be consumed by petty jealousy, petty jealousy, selfishness, sexual sin and so on. However, please note that not all our problems have their roots in our personal sin. As we saw in Job 5.7, human beings are born to trouble just as surely as the sparks fly upwards. Now we saw earlier that all scripture is God breathed. It is so important for each one of us to personally maintain an open and responsive relationship with the Lord, studying the whole word of God and fellowshipping with our family in Christ. We also need to teach our children and grandchildren the word of God as the opportunities arise. And those who preach and teach have an even greater responsibility to impart the whole word of God. But let's let end on a note of encouragement. There are two miracles in Judges. Miracle number one. After Israel's wayward behaviour and violent actions, it is only by God's grace there was still an Israel in existence. And it's a miracle for us too that we are loved and cherished by God and he has promised in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you, never will I forsake you. Now, miracle number two, and I quote, Judges shows how it is a vain and wayward people who are endowed by his spirit can accomplish the mission God gives them, even us. We saw last week, each one of us is a unique person, totally loved by God, to fulfil his unique purposes in spite of our failings. Wow. And in conclusion, this book of Judges shows us that Israel is in desperate need of a godly king who will lead the Israelites in love and obedience to the Lord. First of all, it is pointing to King David, and then a greater than David, Jesus Christ, King of Kings, our Saviour.